inquiry and ask, you know, where where are the where are the impressionists? And um, the consummate impressionist Claude Monet. We have an extraordinary collection of his work. I'm just showing you the great 1872 uh, bridge at Argentoy uh, on the left, and then his very famous painting of his wife and son, Madame Monet, um, and young. Um, uh, uh, his young son uh, standing on a hillside. These are paintings that are all about sunshine and um, the beautiful French uh, countryside just outside the city, uh, the suburbs, um, uh, beautiful fashions, uh, leisure time. Um, uh, oh, here's a, a wonderful slide. This is one of my favorite slides that um, is actually quite close to the way these paintings are hung in, in the, the main classic impressionist gallery. You have flanking Monet's um, artist garden at Vetoy, two paintings of, of little girls by Renoir, Auguste Renoir, who is one of my favorite uh, painters in the in the gallery's collection. Um, and you see him, actually the little girl with a watering can at the right is I believe uh, the most well, the mo one of the most popular paintings at the gallery, and we know that because um, the reproduction of the picture, uh, Little Girl with a Watering Can, in postcard form is the, is the greatest seller. So we sell more reproductions of her than any other painting in the gallery. And then at the far left, a painting of a, of a girl with a hoop. Um, uh, this is a 19th century game that kids would play in public in uh, parks uh, in Paris. Um, and, uh, and then um, you know that Claude Monet was an ardent gardener, uh, and this is before he buys his property in Giverny. He owned a garden uh, just behind his house in Vetoy, and this beautiful spring shot of, um, of sunflowers, uh, and again, some, some, some children uh, and uh, his wife on the staircase. But these, again, are, are paintings about color, and I think this is why they're so popular. They're just so exuberant and um, joyful. Uh, and I will say that uh, what, what I usually do, I think it's, it's great that people love these pictures so much. It is incredibly difficult to control this volume of color. And uh, Renoir and, and Monet are absolute geniuses to be able to, to, to pull this off for any of our uh, uh, painters in the, in the audience. You know how hard it is when you start to play with uh, really vibrant um, uh, colors on the palette. Uh, so these are these are very difficult to to to, to pull off, um, um, and I think you know rightfully um, uh, sort of universally acclaimed. Um, and I just throw this in because this is one of my favorite pictures by Renoir. Uh, it surprises people, and so I just as a little surprise to make sure you all are still awake. This is um, actually from 1870, so before the Impressionist movement has begun in 1874. This is Renoir playing in the genre of Orientalism. This is his girlfriend slash model, Lise Trejo, and he's borrowed or rented a uh, costume from North Africa. And he sort of tricked out his studio with um, objects that have a kind of uh, oriental, Orientalist um, sort of um, aura. Uh, and it's just, it's a fantastic picture. Again, one of my favorites, the way that he's able to convey the fabrics, the various textures from um, transparent bodice to the sort of heavily brocaded jacket that she wears, the feather coming um, off her headdress, and then that incredibly erotic pose and expression. Um, I just think it's one of the more powerful pictures. Um, the, uh, also uh, extremely popular, obviously, are the works that we have by these two guys, these bad boys of French painting, um, Vincent van Gogh and uh, Paul Gauguin. Um, and we happen to have two fantastic self-portraits by them. Um, we are now into post-Impressionism. These uh, painters were very much inspired by the Impressionists, but took French painting, avant-garde French painting in radical new directions. Um, they were close friends, and they shared a kind of messianic um, missionary zeal about their project of painting. Uh, they felt that they were uh, sort of sent to, to the world to not only redeem French painting, but also um, sort of the role of, of artist in, in society, uh, as well as um, 
society itself. I mean, they they felt that their impact was going to be much broader than just making a, 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 a body of work. Um, they both also interestingly looked intently to non-Western culture and art. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show you two paintings by Vincent van Gogh, who, you know, I, I think he's having a, another resurgence of popularity. There's a, um, a project you may have heard about um, traveling across America. I think it's called the Van Gogh Experience, which does not include actual art objects, but sort of capitalizes on this insatiable hunger for anything having to do with, with Van Gogh uh, in, in America, certainly. Um, the painting at the upper left is my favorite. It's called La Mousme, and it is inspired by a novel that Van Gogh reads by Pierre Loti, uh, Madame um, Chrysanthemum. It's based on a kind of um, a sort of orientalizing fictional account uh, that Pierre Loti writes about Japan. And Van Gogh uh, travels down to Arles and feels that he has discovered the Japan of, 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 the, of Southern France in terms of color and light and a kind of exotic other. Um, and it's just, this is such a spectacular, um, vibrant image. And then interestingly for our audience, I think is the picture at the lower right, it's called Roses. And it was given to the gallery by Pamela Harriman who was, of course, the uh, American ambassador to France um, in Paris under the um, presidency of Bill Clinton. So this painting hung in the uh, American ambassador's residence in Paris. And then um, she ended up giving it to, in honor of uh, one of her husbands, uh, Averill Harriman, to the National Gallery. And so it hangs um, permanently on our walls. Um, and then, uh, I believe that one of the most successful galleries uh, in the French paintings department in the West Building is the Cezanne Gallery. It's one of my favorite places to go. Um, we do not have the largest collection of Cezanne in the country, but I think it is one of the strongest. And uh, particularly, we are able to show this great French painter uh, in all three of the genres in which he sort of basically deconstructed still life, landscape, and figure painting. And these three pictures are iconic images in those three genres. There's the um, still life with a peppermint bottle in the upper left, um, this marvelous houses in Lestac, and then I hope you're all familiar with the wonderful um, boy in a red, red waistcoat, which Paul Mellon, it was Paul Mellon's favorite picture, and it was the cover image of our great Cezanne portrait exhibition that we did a couple of years ago. Um, and this was the one that we shared with the Musée d'Orsay. We do quite a bit of work with the Louvre, of course, and with the Musée d'Orsay, among other French museums. Um, but we had a wonderful time working on Cezanne's portraits with our colleagues at the Orsay. And it was this exhibition that I had the great honor and pleasure of touring um, Madame Macron, and Mrs. Trump, uh, the first ladies, took a little moment out of an incredibly busy day to come and see this show. We spent about 25 minutes looking at these pictures. And I still, to this day, recall a, an incredibly smart um, comment that Madame Macron made about another version of this same subject, the same uh, model, Michelangelo de Rosa, in a, in a work that um, David Rockefeller owned. And uh, that picture had not been able to travel to the Orsay venue of this exhibition. And uh, I was showing her the Rockefeller picture, which was here at the gallery, and she noticed that she hadn't seen it in the Orsay version of the exhibition. Um, so that was, I just, it really um, warmed the curatorial cockles of my heart to find such an august public figure really paying attention to the things that, that, um, that, uh, that, that these national museums, this wonderful program that the national museums collaborated on. So that was really exciting. Um, let's see. Say, I'm, not, I'm not surprised by what you say about Mrs. Macron because she's very, very knowledgeable. She had a high culture. She uh, was uh, teaching French literature and, uh, and she always um, gave uh, to the, the students a curriculum uh, marrying art and literature. So she she has always been very open and and very eager to share her 
passion for literature and and art. Just some things that is amusing for um, people who are French here is that you, you when you talked about the West building. Um, um, whose architect is Mr. Pay. Well, so and, uh, another common point with, with the Louvre in Paris, where we have the pyramid by the same architect. So uh, two different places across the ocean, but with the, the touch of the, of the same architect. And another something that is a little bit amusing, you talked about the House of Cards by Sharda. And you know, for French people who were completely uh, fascinated by the TV show House of Cards, it's quite funny to think that this uh, this painting by Sharda of the 18th century arrived in Washington D.C., specially made for, for <laughs> circumstances. That's a great. That's a great, uh, great comment. And in fact, the um, in the House of Cards, the gallery is a is a um, a venue. There's a there's a furtive you know sort of terrifying meeting uh, you know between some nefarious politicos and 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 one of those meetings takes place just off the uh, the rotunda in the West Building so we were really excited. I must admit that I have heard I haven't seen this TV show but I've heard about it a lot. Yeah. Um, so now, Mary, could you share with us uh, your your thoughts and feelings about the paintings that should be for you the most emblematic of the National Gallery of Washington DC? Oh, I see that you have chosen Napoleon by David. So we are very touched by this toy. <laughs> could you tell us more? Well, I mean, it's you know, yeah, it's a very, very powerful picture. Um, and, you know, it may not be the most emblematic of our collection, but I think for 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 this audience, uh, you know, it could be it could be the most poignant. And it's also quite relevant, given that 2021 is l'année Napoléon uh, being well, we'll talk about that being sort of celebrated, or let's say commemorated in France this year. Um, this is a portrait that uh, Jacques-Louis David, the great, you know, one of the greatest fr French painters and the great uh, neoclassical painter, um, does of uh, one of his, his, um, his great sort of patrons, Napoleon, rather late. This is from 1812. And so you may be thinking of the more famous portrait of Napoleon on horseback uh, crossing the Pyrenees. Uh, the great romantic, it's probably the, the sort of poster image for the romantic hero of the late 18th, early 19th century. This portrait, I, I love this painting because it's, 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 it's quite a part, it's, it's definitely heroic, but now you have Napoleon actually in his study. Um, and so you know there's a reference there in the sword that's laying uh, uh, on his um, fauteuil there uh, at his uh, left that of course he's the great general, the great imperial master, um, uh, military strategist. But this portrait is all about Napoleon staying up all night writing himself at his desk, the code Napoleon. So you can see uh, that it's rolled up, the code is rolled up uh, on his desk, down at his feet, and I'm sure he's sitting there all night long writing and at his feet he has a gigantic tome of Plutarch, because in, or, in order to construct this incredible backbone of the French legal and governmental system, he is going to be consult, cons consulting the, the great classic philosophers um, and historians. Uh, and you see that the candle on his desk is burned way low, the clock up um, uh, just behind him shows that it's 10 to 4 a.m. He is a little bit disheveled. He's a little bit sweaty. His hair is a little bit um, unkempt. He has a five o'clock shadow. He hasn't shaved because he has been working on behalf of the French people all night long, um, putting this um, this code together. Uh, and um, of course, he you know this is this is not uh, accurate at all. He had uh, prior to eighteen twelve and prior to the prior to the debut of the Code Napoleon, he had had legions of uh, hundreds, I think six hundred lawyers were working on this tract. Um, but this is a this is a great uh, act of political propaganda on the on the part of David. Absolutely spectacular. It's you know it's not the kind of thing that I think the the contemporary French audience in 1812 would have responded to they knew where the code napoleon came from um, and in fact it wasn't made for the french audience it was a commission from a british duke 
living in Scotland who wanted an image of, of Napoleon and this is what David produces. Napoleon himself loved the painting, had a replica made by David, it actually belongs to Versailles, um, but we have this original portrait coming from the Crest Foundation. Um, so it's a difficult time uh, for uh, Napoleon and uh, the reception of Napoleon and the consideration of Napoleon 2021. Um, and I think really those two terms, are we celebrating and glorifying Napoleon with the um, series of exhibitions, mostly in France, but around the world? Uh, or are we commemorating and sort of, you know, reconsidering Napoleon and his impact, which is absolutely um, ineluctable on, uh, the, on the French nation. Um, he is, uh, and, and at the gallery, we are hard at work in the West Building and the East Building, um, sort of contextualizing uh, and, and providing a historical perspective for images like this. I mean, in, in, in my opinion, you, you can't really exhibit an image, a painting like this, as we do in the center of one of the central galleries off the sculpture court without providing sort of context uh, for who this man was, for the history of Europe, for the history of France, and for our collection. Um, you know, Napoleon, of course, he stages the coup d'etat in 1799, um, uh, the, ninth, the uh, 18th Brumaire. Um, in 1804, he crowns himself emperor and um, initiates a really aggressive imperial campaign across Europe. Um, and then one uh, aspect as we, um, you know, really sort of um, re return to conventional historical narratives of Europe and um, op open up and expose and rediscuss certain chapters of that colonial history. Um, it's important to, to recall that in, in, in the, during the French Revolution, slavery was abolished in 1802. Uh, Napoleon um, brings it back, uh, brings slavery back to the French uh, colonies. And so we need to sort of discuss this and talk about it and um, really talk about the complexity of, of a world historic figure like Napoleon. Um, so great painting, really important painting, not a painting that we want to put away, but a painting that we want to use as the focal point to um, you know, talk about some of the more difficult aspects of, of our uh, Western history. Um, it's just an incredible opportunity. So I'm looking forward, I mean, we've just reopened the West Building and I, I'm looking forward over the next couple of years really to um, a project that we're discussing of refreshing the stories that we tell in the West Building, of using technology to help tell those stories, of engaging um, a younger and more diverse demographic, uh, attracting uh, a, a more diverse demographic to the stories that we tell. So, um, you know, it's a really great moment uh, for, for, for the National Gallery. Um, we just unfurled our rebranded National Gallery just a few weeks ago. I hope some of you saw, saw that. Um, and it's just gonna be really exciting moving forward. Um, thank you, Marie. Well, it's going yeah. to be very interesting. And you, you put a new light on, on this painting and uh, David, it was the one also worked on the propaganda uh, for Napoleon because he was the one chosen to uh, make a painting of the coronation. Um, so yes, uh, so yep. the, the, the point that is going to be very interesting for us is that uh, what, what we see that everything is going to be very, uh, not well, maybe politically correct, you know, all this new, uh, we are going to discover a new face of, of Napoleon thanks to uh, the lens through which you're going to present his, uh, his, his work, his reign. Um, so it's going to be uh, very, very interesting. And, and we see that the National Gallery uh, follows a big, big trend, uh, maybe not of rewriting history, but uh, give a new light on some, uh, some events um, and, and part of our history. So it, it's going to be a, a great adventure. Yes. <laughs> it's going to be very uh, interesting, maybe dangerous, but uh, very interesting. So um, we will all see that with a great, uh, great interest. Um, tell us now, uh, what are your favorite uh, really favorite artworks, so the, the one that you love deeply in your in your art. I know we know that you lo love them all, but maybe you have some favorite. Yeah, thank you. Yes, 
Um, often uh, cu curators' favorites are uh, comprised of um, pictures that they have had a hand in bringing in to the collection, um, acquisitions. And in the uh, roughly decade that I've been, uh, been able to work with the gallery, um, I'm just going to show you a couple of, of these. This was actually the very first acquisition uh, in 2010 when I arrived that, um, that I was able to signal and uh, get, get support for. It's a wonderful picture um, uh, by Jean-Francois de Troyes. It's uh, certainly a Rococo painting of the abduction of Europa. Beautiful little picture, great color, wonderful uh, technique, great, wonderful story from Ovid of Jupiter who falls in love with the princess Europa. And so he, as he always was doing, transforms himself into, um, in this case, a, a, a gorgeous white bull. Um, and he kind of um, moseys over to the group of, um, of ladies in waiting, uh, uh, spending some time with the princess and they fall in love with him because he's so beautiful. As you can see, they start to decorate him with flowers. Europa pets him and climbs, climbs up on his back and kablam, he's out of there off to Crete in order to procreate basically Europa, Europe. Um, and so great, wonderful, dramatic subject, but I think taken with a, a light hand in this work by Dutois, which came up at auction. It was actually an auction through um, uh, a house in Saint-Lys, which I had never visited before uh, outside of Paris. And we were able to get this for a very small price in part because the signature and the date had been covered up at some point for some unknown reason. And so it was a painting unsigned and un, uh, undated. Um, when we brought it back to the gallery and cleaned it, those were unveiled. They appear on the tree trunk at the right. So that was really exciting, but it's just a wonderful light um, uh, <laughs> um, sort of na narrative painting that I think works really well with our Fragonards and Vatos and Bouchers. Um, a slightly more august, uh, sort of heavy with gravitas picture um, that came in just a few years. This is the, uh, the most recent acquisition uh, for the French paintings collection. Uh, this is a work from the early 17th century by Simone Vouet, who had been a major painter in Rome when Rome really was the center of painting in Europe. Um, and you think about Caravaggio and everybody's drinking the Kool-Aid of Caravaggio in the early part of the 17th century in Rome and what Caravaggio brings to painting and its sort of monumentality and um, a kind of um, realist sensuality. And Simone Vouet is there painting. He's called back to um, by Louis XIII to be his court painter in 1627. And this is now just a few years after that in which he has established his own studio and really sort of comes up with what would become the great school of French painting in the 17th century. You think about Poussin um, in particular. Um, and what I love about this painting is that it has that marvelous sort of Roman feel. She's a real Romana, this Madonna, and she's just in love with her baby. There's a real sensuality to this fantastic image. It's, it's um, a composition that Vouet would be very famous for, the Madonna and Child. He did about a dozen paintings that were immediately engraved and disseminated around Europe. But this is the only known version that is signed and dated by Vouet. And you see, for instance, the, the French tricolor there. It's just a sort of a classically French painting, but indebted to the European pan, pan European uh, cult around Caravaggio. Um, so uh, really one of my favorite pictures. The, the composition oh. is quite original because it's, uh, it's very seldom to see Infantezes turning his back uh, towards you, the viewer, usually his blessing or his uh, um, is uh, is nursed or uh, is looking at the viewer. Mary is completely in love with the uh, with the Virgin Mary. Yeah, it's it's really sweet. I mean, it's a very intense um, moment between between mother and child. Um, in fact, when it came when it was discovered a couple of years ago, uh, it hadn't been on the market. Um, the little baby Jesus was was covered. There was a, a fabric that uh, somebody had in painted probably in the 19th century just to cover up some of that nakedness. Also her neck and her shoulder were covered with a, um, a fabric. And so somebody clearly was, uh, and her hair was neatened up into a little chignon. So we had to, um, a, one of uh, a wonderful conservator removed all of that overpaint 
to reveal actually a paint surface that was in excellent condition underneath. Um, but at some point, somebody was uncomfortable, I think, with the sensuality. But this is what I think is the power of this painting. Um, I mean, this is, you know, the, uh, the, the Virgin and, and, and baby Jesus. So it's um, obviously a, an august subject. But, uh, but it's also, I think, very relatable in this moment of the kind of tactile relationship between um, that, that, that uh, adheres to, to the relationship between mothers and their babies. Um, anyway, so this is one of my uh, favorites. You will find this uh, in the 17th century uh, galleries, which are not um, on the right side of the rotunda. A little bit difficult to find, but... Um, who, was the, who was the owner? Where did you buy it? Was it in France or was it somewhere else in the world? It, it had actually left France, um, we think sometime in the 19th century for Italy. It came out of Northern Italy from a family. It had been in a family that had um, ties to France. So it was a, a French family that had migrated to Italy and been in Italy for at least a hundred years. Um, and so in discovery, I mean, it was not known. This composition wasn't known, the painting wasn't known. So it was really exciting. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just, again, one of my favorite pictures. Um, I am a huge fan. I am actually an expert in 19th century French. And one of my great favorites of the century is Camille Corot, who of course was the great landscape painter. I mean, I just don't think you would have had the ascendance of landscape as the genre, um, the most ambitious genre of 19th century French painting without Corot, who takes landscape painting from the neoclassical tradition of the 1820s all the way up to the feet of the Impressionists in the 1870s. What is less known is Corot as a figure painter. And it so happens that in the Chesterdale collection, we have his finest uh, example, his, his largest example. This is almost life size this uh, wonderful 1866 picture of Agostina, just a kind of, you know, very, um, um, she's almost like a, a symbol of, of, of Italy. One of these, um, one of the models of Coro dressed in the garb of the Italian Campagna and um, just in her broad shoulders and the kind of um, uh, m monumental way in which her facial features are, are described and her presence. Uh, and so I was inspired by this picture really to do an exhibition that we were able to do a couple of years ago on the female figure paintings of, of Corot. And I hope that, uh, that, that some, some of your members were able to see that uh, exhibition. Um, we have one of the strongest collections of Corot's work uh, anywhere. Sorry, this is my, my puppy keeps wanting to come in and hear all about the French paintings of the National Gallery. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy that you chose Coho because I have a special relationship with Coho because you know he's from Ville d'Avray in uh, the suburb of Paris and he painted a very large number of the, the pounds uh, at Ville d'Avray. And, and I wanted to know what you, what you think about that. There is a sort of mythology in France saying that Coho was, uh, well, that you can find a Coho with the pounds of Ville d'Avray in every museums of the world. Uh, and well, every time I go to music and check and I will find uh, Ville d'Avray by Coho. And, and there is a myth saying that uh, Coho was very generous with his signature, helping friends, uh, so that there are a lot of coros that are not supposed to be done by Coro, but by other people who just, uh, with his agreement, because he was very generous, generous and helpful, uh, allowed them to, to put his signature. What, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. Um, uh, I mean, the joke that we tell in the United States is that uh, Coro painted uh, th 3,000 paintings in his long life, in his long career, uh, 5,000 of which are in American public collections. Um, and it's true, every single art museum in the country has a Coro landscape painting, mostly these late Ville d'Avray souvenirs. Um, and so that's what was so exciting to just sort of um, refocus attention on a, an aspect of his oeuvre that was much less known. Um, but yes, the Coro attribution, uh, uh, field is, is, is very lively. I mean, there's a lot of work being done trying to separate out what is by his hand uh, and what is not. Um, I think equally for the work of Gustave Courbet, uh, attribution uh, is, a, is there, there are a lot of, uh, it's, a very, it's a very sort of um, contested field. Um, but with the figures less so, um, because they were less well known. In fact, he didn't exhibit his female figures during his life. Only once did he exhibit uh, um, um, uh, a, a figure painting. 
Um, and so they're, they're just less known. But this painting in particular was uh, revered by artists like Brock and, uh, and Picasso. In fact, there was a reproduction of this painting hanging in Brock's studio. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's a way in which Coro's work in this area fed the figural work of Cezanne, definitely, and then Picasso and Brock and sort of early 20th century uh, figural abstraction. Um, so this is what's so wonderful about French painting is that there is a kind of linear trajectory of development because everybody's in Paris, it's so centralized and generationally all of the young Turks, uh, as they call them, are looking at um, you know, the older generation to see how they can innovate and advance French painting. And so there's a very kind of neat story that art historians are able, able to stitch together. And they, um, would and go I, to the Louvre, they would go to the Louvre and they would copy. Yes, exactly. They're all looking at the same, it's all, they're all in the same classroom, basically. Um, and so it's really rich in that way. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, another favorite, Vanessa, is this, uh, this wonderful painting by Gustav Kaibot. You mentioned the exhibition that we did with the Kimball Museum called The Painter's Eye. Mm -hmm. Gustav Kaibot, who's, who's a less now better known, but gen relatively speaking, a lesser known impressionist painter. Um, and so we were able to do a really fun exhibition with the great masterpiece from the Art Institute of Chicago, Paris Street, Rainy Day, and our wonderfully generous uh, uh, colleagues there um, sharing that picture with both venues. Um, this painting belonged to a California family um, living in Rancho Palos Verdes, and this was their wonderful family treasure. They lent it to the exhibition, and they so loved uh, the experience of the exhibition, the sensation of having, you know, millions of people enjoying their picture in the context of our loan exhibition, that they ended up giving it uh, to the gallery in, in order to sort of permanently share it with the people. And their um, caveat, of course, is that we keep it on view for at least 25 years. Of course, we'll never take this painting down. It's so beautiful. It's a painting of Kaibot's garden. He was a master gardener, a very serious gardener, just like Monet. They actually compared notes about certain strains of flowers that they were developing. Um, in this case, dahlias, and Kaibot had a famous collection of dahlias in his greenhouse that you see just behind this wonderful hedge. Um, and, uh, and then in the way back, that is his painting studio. Uh, so really exciting to have this uh, come into the collection just a, a couple of years ago from a California family called the Scharfenbergers. So this is absolutely one of my favorites. Um, and just to show you, the, uh, we had a painting by Kaibot in our collection already. This was a picture of these fellows um, in skiffs on the river Yer, uh, and this was given by Paul Mellon, uh, who had bought his painting at the same gallery in New York City that George Scharfenberger had bought the dahlias. So there was this moment in 1967 when um, the uh, Wildensteins did a marvelous exhibition of, uh, of Kaibot. Um, so that, that is exciting to have two of them. Uh, his oeuvre is a little bit rare because he ends up dying rather young and um, there aren't as many Kaibots um, as there are certainly Monet's, Renoir's, um, et cetera. He's really more well known nowadays than he, he was uh, 20 years ago. Yes. When people thought about Kaibot, they would talk in French because the leg Kaibot, meaning the donation of his collection. The donation of his collection to the French government, the French state was highly complicated nobody wanted of his collection so, so he is much more he was at that time much more known about his his work as a collector than his work as a painter so his his fame his, his glory uh, just came up uh, in the late uh, late 20 years and we are very happy uh, we all put are very happy about that so i think that your favorite are going to become our favorite at the National Gallery. Um, thank you, Mary. Uh, if we if we choose um, a topic, um, uh, a theme, what would you choose in the gallery? Well, um, my favorite story that we do tell, and I, again, I think moving forward, we're going to be telling more stories, as it were, with wall text, technology, reinstallations. But in 2012, I was able to um, reinstall the 19th century collection, and there are specific stories that each gallery tells. Um, only um, uh, some of the galleries have actual wall texts that articulate what the story is. Um, and this is, this, is, this is one of my favorites. 
Um, and this is the story that I'm, I'm going to just show you some of the objects in, uh, I believe it's gallery 85. Um, and the organizing principle, the narrative principle in that gallery is modern Paris. And specifically what happens in Paris in the 1850s and 60s, which is the famous sort of radical, rather um, from an urban design point of view, violent event called house monetization, um, which was incredibly disorienting and very exciting for the young painters who would become the Impressionists. And in a way, I don't think you have Impressionism as the first modernist movement of painting without this event that occurs in the city. Um, when the old Paris really was kind of rearranged and, 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 and um, deconstructed and uh, uh, what was born over the course of about 20, 25 years is the modern Paris that we recognize. Um, and so there's Edouard Manet, who uh, is a, uh, from an old Parisian family, spent his entire life in Paris. And all of this is happening around him as a, as a young man, the, destru the destruction and the construction constant over the 1850s and 60s. And he paints this picture, which is belongs to the Chester Dale collection. Uh, it's a collection of paintings that are not allowed to leave the building. And so um, if, 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 it, um, if you want to see this picture, you have to come to the gallery. So all of the exhibitions that have happened around Impressionism and Paris and Manet have not included this painting unless that project happened at the gallery. Um, this is a picture that he does in 1862. Um, and he, uh, he, it's a, a very large painting. He intends to show it at the Salon, uh, but he doesn't actually submit it to the Salon for some interesting reasons that if we had one whole hour to talk about this picture, I would love to go into. But um, I'm just uh, uh, gonna give you sort of some basics on this painting. It's called The Old Musician. And to my mind, and there are a lot of interpretations of what's going on here, but to my mind, it's really about the people who are being kind of flushed out of the center of Paris during this aggressive moment of, of gentrification in the city. These are the people that would have lived in the very center of the city that were sort of pushed out to the liminal spaces outside the outer arrondissement, which are, as you know, tend to be the areas where um, there's more affordable housing. Um, and um, I mean, uh, certainly not at this time, but where they sort of flushed people out um, uh, from, from, from the city center. So you've got an itinerant musician, um, this uh, bohemian uh, with his instrument, he's playing for money. Uh, and then you have um, these uh, sort of street urchins, homeless children uh, to the left. Uh, homeless children um, were a serious problem, urban problem identified and discussed in the, in the, in the press. Um, and felt to be somewhat of a threat. In fact, 1862 is the very year that Victor Hugo writes Les Miserables. And if you remember that wonderful figure in Les Mis called Gavroche, this young homeless kid, he has no family and he just loves the idea of revolution. It's very exciting. It's a kind of um, fraternity that he wants to join. Um, and so there's this sensation that this is a problem that's going to be difficult for um, the, the, the ruling elite. Um, and so here uh, Manet is painting them. And then this kind of iconic figure in the top hat at back, who is called the absinthe drinker in another composition by Manet, um, a kind of rag picker, um, an addict really. And he's a, he's a figure straight out of um, the poetry of Charles Baudelaire. And it's Baudelaire who actually writes the essay calling contemporary artists to picture what's going on in Paris in the moment, the epic nature of modernity in Paris at this moment. And this is an essay that absolutely um, inspires artists like Manet to paint pictures like this. Mary, um, uh -huh. so many, so many questions from time is, is flying. So I don't know if we will have time to talk about Le Peintre de la Vie Moderne by Baudelaire. But in fact, I, I have, I, I need to, to, to ask you some questions from the audience. Um, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, well, let's, there, there is one question, the first one, um, and it's a personal question. Mary, what is your favorite museum or collection in France? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, of course, my gosh, there's the Louvre and the, and the Musée d'Orsay, which is closer to my area of expertise. The, the Musée d'Orsay is 1848 to about 1914, which is specifically the area that I've uh, most studied. 
Um, I have to say that an, another museum that I've really fallen in love with recently is the, um, the Petit Palais, which is the Museum of the City of Paris. Of um, uh, It's kind of like the Louvre and the Orsay combined, but instead of national, it belongs to the city of Paris. I'm sure you all are very familiar with it. In one of, in, uh, one of these great exposition uh, uh, buildings, um, uh, right across the street from the Grand Palais, the Petit Palais, a wonderful uh, museum. Um, and then of course there are the smaller museums, the Cognac J, which I love. Um, uh, oh my gosh, uh, there's so many, the Gustave Moreau, these little um, small, smaller museums are uh, a little bit harder to find and, and less on the beaten track that are nevertheless um, incredibly um, satisfying when you um, step into them off, off, the, off these smaller streets and alleys. Wonderful. Um, there is another question which is more uh, technical and who, which appealed to your proficiency. Uh, uh, there is a question about Gauguin and uh, if there is or not, or how there is a relationship with the Nabi group. Ah, yes, yes, absolutely. So the Nabi actually, um, like Gauguin, and I think they take their cue from Gauguin, considered themselves to be sort of um, missionary, missionary artists in a way. There was a spiritual component and almost religious component to their project, to their artistic project. Um, and they were very serious. They had a kind of um, brotherhood that involved certain rituals. Uh, and this idea that painting could speak to the spirit, of course, in addition to the emotions and to the eye, and to the intellect, but that it also could have a kind of ameliorating effect on one's own life, but also on, on, on the lives of people that engaged with your artwork. Um, it's this really uh, beautiful idea about art that I think most people that love art feel rather profoundly, whether or not it's, it's Catholic um, or uh, Christian, uh, or just or spiritual or a world religion that there's something going on with really powerful artworks that uh, transcends uh, the material. Uh, and so this absolutely the Nabi take from from Goga certainly Van Gogh felt this way. Um, and and uh, yeah, emblematic work by the Nabi is named the talisman uh, in French, mm -hmm. not the word in English, so which is very uh, a word that is very powerful and full of spirituality and transcendence. Mm -hmm. uh, so Beautiful. It, it's in the, the name. Exactly. Of the emblematic work of art for, of the Navi group. Yeah. Um, we have uh, just a few minutes ahead, but uh, I have a question about the, the rotation of the, of the French paintings. In fact, in your permanent collection, do you have room to show everything or do you make rotation? Um, I'm asking a question, this question, I, I completely share this question by, by, with, with the audience because, uh, for instance, when I go to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and I want specially to see a portrait, for instance, I'm thinking about the portrait by uh, Emile Zola made by Manet, and every time I want to go and see it, uh, it's never shown. Mm -hmm. so, so, so we were wondering how, how it works for the, for the collections of the French paintings at the National Gallery. Yep, yep. thank you. Yeah, the, um, in fact, the collection of the National Gallery is relatively young. Uh, so if, if, our, if our museum is opening just in 1941, and you think about some of the other um, more uh, classical august museums in the United States, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Philadelphia, Cleveland, these are all, um, a hundred, hundred, the Metropolitan is, is celebrating its 150th anniversary last year. Um, we are half that age. Um, and so we don't actually have much art in storage. The, uh, the, 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 the art that we have is, is for the most part on the walls. Um, and rotation, and just speaking to your, um, your uh, Manet's portrait of Zola, which is one of the great paintings of the 19th century, absolutely. I have a feeling that that painting is probably on loan to exhibitions if it's not on the walls of the Orsay. I don't think they would put that painting in storage. And when you come to the gallery and you don't find your favorite picture, it's not, it's in all likelihood, it's not in storage. We haven't put it in storage. We're lending it to an exhibition somewhere else. So I would say, I mean, I think it's, um, it's actually kind of interesting that, that most of the, of the great works of art that we have, we have out. Um, and in fact, in 1941, when we opened the West Building, there was not enough art. There were many, many of those galleries that I showed you were closed because there wasn't enough art to go up. But um, 
the uh, thanks to the generosity of, of Americans over these last 70 years, um, we've been able to, to flesh, flesh out the, the um, pre-1900 collection, certainly. Um, and as, 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 as I pointed out with the, the Kaibot bequest from the Scharfenberger family, this, this tradition continues to this day. It's um, really responsible for, for, for and, and the impetus there, of course, as it is for the Orsay and the Louvre is the desire to share your art with, um, you know, with the nation. Uh, and um, that's a kind of um, old fashioned patriotic instinct but um, you know, it, it never it never goes away. It sort of waxes and wanes. But um, but uh, it's certainly a beautiful thing. So I'm I'm afraid we are we, we need to conclude. But I have a very last question for you, uh, which is more of a recommendation. What do you suggest for a beginner uh, who wants to discover French art? Um, what, what would be your advice for this person? How to approach to understand French uh, art and culture? Well, I mean, the the, gal the gallery is a great place to start because it's free, and you can come in for five minutes, ten minutes, three hours. Um, we have a lot of material online. Um, I mean, I. I think that the most important thing to do is just to come and look and you can read books and you can take classes and you can watch videos on on your screen. But the best thing to do is to come and look and look again and keep looking and de develop your eye and, and, and discover in yourself what you respond to. So whether that, you know, that may not be French painting at all, that may be Rembrandt or that may be um, Duccio or that may be sculpture, you know, maybe it's three dimensional art. But I think the more that you that you go and look at, at actual art objects, you learn about yourself. Um, and then once you figure out what's really turning you on, then you go out and um, you know download books under your computer. Or we have our library, of course, is open to the public, um, and do the reading. And what you'll find is that when you when you start to gravitate towards what you naturally instinctively love, and then you learn more about it, that um, pleasure that um, stimulation only enhances the more that you learn. So I call it sort of ratcheting up the buzz. I mean, find out what makes you vibrate. And then the more you learn, the more the vibration increases. And it's a, it's a lifetime activity. I mean, this is, this is the game I'm in. I just, the more, the, every, the more I do, the, 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 more, the more pleasurable it is. It's a marvelous image. Yeah. So Mary, thank you very much. We are all very grateful. Um, I say goodbye. I hope we will see thank you. Uh, all of us for the next uh, meetings and next event of the museum series organized by the French Embassy. So thank, thank you, you very so much. Thank you, Vanessa. Bye. Great pleasure.